Hello and welcome to this lecture on HG Wells is the Red Room. In this lecture, I will do a bit of close reading of the first half of the story and talk about the implications of uh, such close reading in terms of the meaning it offers for the readers. Hedgy Wells, to give you a brief uh, introduction about him, is also known as the father of science fiction. It's a title he shares with Jules Verne too. He's also well known for uh, works such as The War of the Worlds, published in 1897, and The Time Machine, published in 1895. He was a prolific novelist, and not only was he a novelist, but he also uh, wrote in a variety of genres, ranging from poetry to prose to autobiography to biography to satire. So he was indeed a very prolific writer. And he is also known as the scientific prophet because he was able to predict a lot of the things in the world of science and technology which actually came true in the succeeding decades. Now, the particular story, The Red Room, was uh, written in 1894, but it was published in the Idler magazine in 1896. And it is uh, a story which is in the gothic mode. Uh, Hedge Wells uh, usually writes uh, science fiction, but he makes a change in this particular story to write a horror or a, a, a kind of a supernatural story which can be termed as gothic. It's a very interesting story uh, and it begins with a, a young man telling his uh, uh, auditors that um, you know it will take a very tangible ghost to frighten me and I stood up before the fire with my glass in my hand. So this is the uh, um, narrator who uh, asserts that he is not going to be easily frightened and that he needs to come across something very concrete something very substantial uh, to believe in ghosts and uh, he, sa he further says well I said if I see anything tonight I shall be so much the wiser for I come to the business with an open mind so he also tells his listeners that he has an open mind that he is a a skeptic who doesn't believe or disbelieve in ghosts but is open to um, being informed about such presences or uh, its absence and um, this story begins in a, a, a big house a mansion uh, and further details of this house will be informed to the reader as the story progresses but um, to inform you at the very outset we have a young male narrator and we have uh, three old people who try to prevent him from spending a night in the apparently red uh, room uh, in the uh, apparently haunted red room and that is the premise of the story and um, the narrator insists that he will test the theory that this particular room is haunted. And uh, what is very interesting uh, here in this set of ideas is that uh, the narrator wants to see uh, before he believes. So seeing is believing for this young man. And you can also uh, get a sense that he believes in experiential data. Uh, he wants uh, information, facts, data before he can make up his mind, before he comes to any kind of conclusion. So even if it's a, a, a theory about ghosts, that has to be tested before he believes it for himself. The old woman who is one of the uh, listeners, uh, who is one of the occupants of that uh, room, which is kind of a uh, housekeeper's place, the old woman sat staring hard into the fire, her pale eyes wide open, 
A, she broke in, and eight and twenty years you have lived and never seen the likes of this house, I reckon. There's many a things to see when once still but eight and twenty. She swayed her head slowly from side to side, a many a things to see and sorrow for. So the, uh, the narrator informs um, this old woman that he has lived in this world for 28 odd years and he hasn't seen a ghost in his entire life and she says that 28 years is too young to see many many things in this world and she says that there are still a lot of things to witness and be sad about and she implies that this man is young and naive to know about the horrors of this particular world and uh, what is uh, further interesting in terms of the description of the old woman is um, uh, words such as um, you know the her pale eyes her pale eyes look at the manner in which she stares hard into the fire uh, in a very single-minded manner And um, she says she sways her uh, head. She's kind of moving her head in a rhythmic manner. It's almost uh, a, a, a kind of a hallucinatory action. So uh, these details about the old woman, her her pallid appearance, uh, her you know uh, uh, disregard of any other aspect except her uh, single-minded uh, opinions about the red room, um, tells us something uh, that uh, this old woman is almost um, in a way uh, you know uh, akin to a ghost herself. She's pale, she's single-minded, and she's swaying her head in a in a rhythmic manner which is apparently uh, preternatural uh, in, 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 in manner so all these ideas about the old people of this house have a particular significance which I'll also unpack in great detail as we progress now uh, she mentions the old woman mentions that um, you know you have never seen the likes of this house and um, you know immediately we understand that this house is a perfect setting for a gothic story and in this particular house we have a particularly dangerous space called the red room so we see the gothic cues in all these uh, spaces and locales and she also mentions that uh, or indicates that this young uh, man is unaware of certain things perhaps from the past which continues to have the impact on the present which is why she sa says that you know he is too young um, to still uh, see many things and uh, be sorrowful about so uh, it is it's not over yet for the young man to uh, remove his misconceptions of the world and there is also a suggestion of tragedy or a suggestion of sadness um, to come and which again um, alerts us to some of the key attributes of a gothic uh, fiction which is that um, things are not going to turn out for the better for the protagonist and that is usually the case with gothic narratives or things are going to be uh, you know full of threat places are going to be full of threat for the uh, safety and security of the major protagonist the central protagonist if you uh, read very closely you will understand that um, the three aged figures uh, will have one other old man come in as the story is progressing so we have an old woman and we have an old man her companion and we have another old man who is going to come into the door of that housekeeper's place as um, the narrator is talking to this woman so we have uh, the aged uh, the old people dominating uh, the scene at the beginning of this particular uh, story and we have the uh, young narrator the young male narrator almost outnumbered he is literally outnumbered by the uh, old people 
and this particular section as I said um, uh, describes the way in which uh, an uh, old man walks into um, the room. Now, it's, it's a kind of a character caretaker's kind of place, a housekeeper's kind of place inside the castle or the big house. I heard the faint sound of a stick and a shambling step on the flags in the passage outside. The door creaked on its hinges as a second old man entered, more bent, more wrinkled, more aged even than the first. He supported himself by the help of a crutch. His eyes were covered by a shade and his lower lip, half averted, hung pale and pink from his decaying yellow teeth. So it's a fantastically rich uh, set of um, information about not only the old man, but also the uh, setting, the house um, uh, and, and its immediate environment uh, that, that is kind of indicated here. So look at the way in which certain words all, uh, always already indicate that it is an old man who is coming in and that it is a decrepit ancient setting that we are in in terms of the story. The sound of a stick, we have a sound of a stick so we can imagine a man uh, with a crutch uh, uh, trying to walk in, a shambling step, it is not a steady step, it is an awkward uh, clumsy uh, step. And the word flags again indicates that it is it's an um, old uh, stone uh, pavement uh, that is outside in the passage and um, look at the creaking, the door creaks, makes a noise in its hinges. So again indicating that it is um, ancient, it is not well kept up, it is not well maintained, um, it is um, it, it needs some kind of uh, uh, rework or refurbishment. So it is creaking, so uh, it is an ancient uh, door perhaps and um, the second man enters and he is more bent as if um, that is possible, he is more bent, more wrinkled, more aged than the first man who is inside and obviously we um, are correct in imagining that he is walking with a crutch and in, interestingly there is a, a shade to one of his eyes, he is perhaps blind or he has a sensitive eye and which again adds to the threat, adds to the threat, the abnormality. the extraordinary quality of these old people and look at the way uh, his lips are described, his lower lip half averted hung pale, once again the word pale, this word had already been used by the uh, narrator to describe um, you know, the old woman, uh, her pale eyes and uh, he, uh, here the lips of this uh, old man is pale and pink and it is also decaying, um, you know uh, there is an association of decay uh, in terms of his yellow teeth. So, they are ancient, they are decrepit, they are decaying, they are also um, somehow threatening. So all these details about the description of these aged people are perfect in terms of the characters who uh, populate the gothic narrative. Now to uh, kind of spell it out in a very clear cut manner, the old people, old age here represents coldness, there is a lack of warmth, there is a lack of warmth or cordiality towards the young narrator. Can we extrapolate from this um, you know uh, dynamic and suggest that the old way of life or the old system is somehow hostile to the young and the new. That is one way to interpret the significance that is invested or embedded in these old characters. Again um, the old people as I said are decrepit or decaying, they are, um, they are kind of on their way out uh, of this particular life. and most importantly they have an aura of eeriness, 
they kind of exude some kind of eeriness or strangeness which is both unwelcome and perhaps dangerous for the narrator too. So all these um, set of ideas uh, increase the uh, um, weird um, quotient of this particular gothic uh, work. And again, uh, the DK suggests that death is not far for these old people and um, and this uh, DK impresses upon the narrator and makes him further uncomfortable and not, um, you know, enjoying the company of these old people. And once again, the appearance is also grotesque. That is, they are not somehow the norm. They are not the ordinary. They are not in the pink of health and therefore they are somehow the other somehow alien so all these uh, ca uh, character attributes need to be thought through and uh, we need to probe as to what they symbolize or indicate in terms of the larger ideological or uh, meaning of this particular story. So what do the old people represent? What do they stand for? What do they signify in terms of the larger message of the story? The narrator um, finds a mirror and he catches a glimpse of him in that uh, mirror and uh, that's what is um, you know, touched upon in this particular set of statements. Uh, the narrator says, I half suspected the old people were trying to enhance the spiritual terrors of their house by their droning insistence. I put down my empty glass on the table and looked about the room and caught a glimpse of myself abbreviated and broadened to an impossible sturdiness in the queer old mirror at the end of the room. So the first uh, line of that paragraph once again points to the narrator's awareness that these old people are trying to increase, um, expand on the spiritual horrors or the terrors of their house. Um, so they're trying to scare him, that's what he says. Uh, or implies here they're trying to increase the horrors of this place and what is interesting to me here is um, the uh, possessive uh, pronoun here their house it's their house it's not literally theirs but it's um, kind of symbolically theirs and since they are the survivors or since they are the people who take care of this particular house. So it, it kind of belongs to them in a symbolic way even though the property might not be theirs in the property deed. So their house is very interesting there and um, look at the manner in which they talk to the narrator. They are droning, um, they are kind of repetitive. Um, so they are both repetitive and reductive. They uh, keep repeating the same things. They suggest that he should not go to the red room tonight of all nights. So that is a kind of a uh, refrain that keeps coming up in the story. And the narrator, he just puts down his empty glass on the table and he uh, takes a, a look about the room and he catches a glimpse of his reflection in a, a really strange mirror. This means strange here strange old mirror so it's it's not a new one it's an old one and it's befitting that it's old because it's an ancient place so um, what is interesting about this uh, reflection the narrator is abbreviated shortened and broadened look at the way he's shortened and broadened and uh, to an impossible sturdiness so this is not an actual reflection not reality that's something we need to remember so um, the mirror is not projecting reality it's projecting an alternate uh, kind of um, illustration or an image of the narrator what can it signify what can it signify so the significance in my interpretation is this the mirror makes the narrator <coughs> grotesque just like the old people 
So when he comes to this space, somehow the narrator himself is reoriented by the speciality of this particular house. The house has a spiritual influence on the narrator too and symbolically he becomes one amongst the people who are already there. So what we have is a grotesque character of the narrator who somehow losing his original viewpoints, originality, his own opinions as he spends more and more time inside the house. So that's one way to read it. That's my way uh, to read this particular section. Now, he has had enough of um, the company of these uh, old people, the old woman and the two uh, um, older men. And he says that if um, I said a little louder so that he could be heard uh, very well by these old people, if you will show me to this haunted room of yours, I will relieve you from the task of entertaining me. And uh, there is, uh, he gets a response uh, from uh, the old man who has a withered hand. There's a candle on the slab outside the door, said the man with a withered hand, looking at my feet as he addressed me. But if you go to the red room tonight, this night of all nights, said the old woman softly. So uh, once again, uh, if you look at the highlighted lines um, in, in the uh, text there, uh, th they are very, very interesting because they have something very interesting to uh, state about either these old people or about some past that's connected with this particular house. So if you look at the first one, this haunted room of yours, um, again the narrator is um, consciously suggesting that it is haunted according to you, it's your haunted room and I want to check whether that uh, is the case by uh, spending the night there. So he's still uh, the skeptic, he's not uh, uh, entirely agreeing with the account that the old people have given him of that red room. and. Um, the man with the withered hand, look at the uh, phrase, look at the identifying phrase, the man with the withered hand, the man with the shade uh, over his eye and the old woman, we don't have proper names. We don't have proper names for the characters in this particular story. What does that suggest? What is the significance of this lack? Are these people types, they represent a particular quality, therefore there is no need for any specific name. They come to stand for some value, some idea, some notion, some meaning which is common to all people who belong to that kind of ideas. So the old people who believe in the supernatural are a particular type and this uh, narrator, this young man, this 28 year old narrator, he is a man who has a scientific bent of mind and he wants to test it out. So there is no need for any kind of uh, particular names to uh, individualize the characters. They are representing particular uh, thought, school of thought. So uh, he says that if you go to the red room tonight and then look at the refrain, this becomes a refrain, this night of all nights, the old woman softly. So there is a suggestion that there is some kind of anniversary on this particular night. So, but what is that anniversary? We don't know. It's very uh, suggestive, not spelt out. Once again, it's a gothic attribute uh, to heighten the threat, heighten the emotion by uh, suggesting that things are going to um, happen badly because it is an anniversary of a particular tragedy. Now, uh, the red room is something we need to think about in terms of its color association. What are the set of ideas, um, the color symbolism associated with the color red? Uh, um, does red indicate um, supernatural uh, element? Does red indicate uh, uh, blood? Does red indicate some kind of tragedy, um, passion and other evil things? 
So uh, why the red room? If you read the story, you will understand that the, the decor of, of the room, the interiors of the room are um, in the color uh, uh, red, are of the color red. Therefore, it is called as a red room. But um, why this uh, color choice for this particular room uh, is a question that you can probe um, in your time. Now, uh, this is a big chunk of um, uh, passage from the story and I have picked this uh, uh, passage for close reading because um, the amount of information and the way the narrator is led to the red room is very interesting and it is also significant uh, in an ideological uh, level too. It has a lot of symbolic significance too. So, um, and the passage I was in long and shadowy with a film of moisture glistening on the wall was as gaunt and cold a thing that is dead and rigid. So this young narrator has left the three old people in the caretaker's room. He takes a candle and he gets out into the passage, the corridor. And it's a long and shadowy corridor um, and look at the way the wa wall is. It has a film of moisture, it's damp and it's glistening, it's shining. It's almost as if that wall is alive. And look at the uh, simile that's going to um, be part of that statement. It was as gaunt and cold a thing that is dead and rigid. So the wall is gaunt. It's, it's almost uh, without life. It's, it's uh, emaciated um, and cold. It's cold to the touch as a thing that is dead and gone, dead and gone rigid. So it's like a dead body. The wall is like a dead body. So that's a very, very ghastly way to describe. It's So the, I would call this a ghastly description of the corridor wall. So um, if you uh, read the story very closely and, and uh, understanding in great detail the function of the words, you will understand that the atmosphere itself is brought alive by the power of writing of H.G. Wells. And it's that setting which um, makes this um, story or the narrative or the passage scary for both the narrator and for the readers. So he is in this passage and it's as if this whole place is alive um, and contradictory is also like the newly dead. Um, but with an effort I sent such thoughts to the right about. So with great effort he just dismisses those uh, scary thoughts. The long drafty subterranean passage was chilly and dusty and my candle flared and made the shadows cower and quiver. Look at the passage. It's, it's a lengthy passage. The corridor is very long and it's drafty. It's full of cold wind. Um, it, it's not warm. It's cold. Subterranean passage. Subterranean means underground. And it's again chilly and dusty and um, the candle makes the shadows move uh, and look at the choice of words cower and cure. So it's as if the shadows are like actual figures. It's as if there is somebody there covering, hiding and, and fearful and, and shaking in fear. So um, as he is moving through this passage, he is making shadows come alive and these shadows uh, act like human beings that are terribly frightened and threatened. So uh, we get an overall sense of coldness uh, in this uh, corridor. The echoes rang up and down the spiral staircase and a shadow came sweeping up after me and another fled before me into the darkness overhead. So 
as he is walking about there are echoes everywhere and there is a spiral staircase w um, uh, in which he climbs and then uh, there is a shadow which comes um, you know after this narrator and the shadow flees before him. So, uh, what the writer is trying to do here is to point out the number of shadows that keep coming up and going past this narrator and these shadows are um, uh, somehow performing the function of chasing uh, symbolically chasing the narrator. I came to the wide landing and stopped there for a moment listening to a rustling that I fancied I heard creeping behind me and then satisfied of the absolute silence pushed open the unwilling, ba unwilling base covered door and stood in the silent corridor. So, he comes to a landing and, and he kind of freezes, he stops there abruptly because he feels as if there is somebody um, you know creeping up behind him, coming behind him to attack him and then he checks there is nothing and there is just silence. So, what he does is he opens the uh, base covered uh, door, it is a, it's a base refers to a green cloth. So, it is a cloth covered door and he opens that door and look at the word unwilling you associate this word with a figure not with an inanimate object not with a lifeless door. So, the door itself seems to be unwilling and he pushes it open and he enters the silent corridor. So, there is another corridor there. So, it is a very very uh, you know elaborate passage, uh, it is a, a long passage and it takes a while for him to cross this and keep going until he comes to the red room. I want to unpack the significance of this um, you know really lengthy passage um, in, a, in a minute. <coughs> The effect. So, he has come to another corridor. So, he has traveled for a while inside this big house, this castle and he has come to another corridor. I call this the moonlit corridor. The effect was scarcely what I expected. For the moonlight coming in by the great window on the grand staircase picked out everything in vivid black shadow or reticulated silvery illumination. So, again a very evocative uh, passage, evocative means it, uh, it brings lots of images into your mind. So, he is in this um, passage and uh, the moonlight is kind of filtered through the window and um, the light falls everywhere on the grand staircase and the light picks out, it kind of brings to the attention everything in shadows or in kind of uh, reticulated, reticulator is, is striped, we have we have a network of uh, um, you know patterns that is reticulated and it all it is everything um, that is illuminated by the moonlight. So, everything is in shadows or silvery illumination, so it is beautiful as well as haunting. Uh, I, I would also associate the word sublime, it is awesomely beautiful, but threatening too. Let us say fearful. Everything seemed in its proper position. So, all the stuff is there in their right places, the stuff that is there in this big house. The house might have been deserted on the yesterday instead of 12 months ago. So, nobody has disturbed this place, everything is in its rightful place. So, um, it could have been deserted yesterday instead of a year ago, um, that is when the inhabitants have uh, vacated um, quote unquote this house. There were candles in the sockets of the sconces, a very interesting word, I will come back to this. And whatever dust had gathered on the carpets or upon the polished flooring was distributed so evenly as to be invisible in my candlelight. So, the whole um, surface, this vast surface is covered with dust and this dust has not been disturbed. So, it is all very even and almost uh, not noticeable. Sconces is a very interesting word. Because because it's a it's a wall bracket for candles, and it's um, it's a word that is uh, used usually in the ancient period, and it once again takes the story back into the Middle Ages rather than uh, to the late 19th century when it was written. So, if you remember, late 19th century we have uh, lighting, uh, all kinds of lamps, and but uh, H. G. Wells wants to um, recreate the ambience of the Middle Ages in this particular story uh, for the most part, which is why his choice of the words cons is here. A waiting stillness was over everything. 
uh, look at the word waiting here like in the last passage that I discussed the unwilling door here we have a waiting stillness stillness is waiting you know something that's very quiet is the quiet waiting um, that's a very interesting word we have um, it the personification here So inanimate things and ideas are being personified and they're almost, uh, you know, turned into uh, human-like figures to increase the eeriness or the strangeness of this atmosphere. I was about to advance and stopped abruptly. So this young man is about to move forward, but he stops again because he's um, kind of uh, frightened or he's taken aback by something. <coughs> A bronze group. So what is he taken aback by? A bronze group stood upon the landing hidden from me by a corner of the wall. But its shadow fell with marvelous distinctness upon the white paneling and gave me the impression of someone crouching to waylay me. So once again he feels that there is a group of people here who is going to attack him, pounce on him, waylay assault him and, and and that's what he is worried about but he realizes it's not a group of people but it is a set of statues and the shadow of these statues falls on the uh, a wall so it's not um, you know the substance but it's just the sh shadow the thing jumped upon my attention the thing jumped upon my attention it's as if he's being jumped upon by a group so the thing jumped upon my attention suddenly he notices this uh, set of objects suddenly and um, I stood rigid for half a moment perhaps. Then with my hand in the pocket that held the revolver, I advanced only to discover a Ganymede and eagle glistening in the moonlight. So when he sees the shadow, he immediately uh, places his hand in the uh, revolver which is inside his pocket and, and kind of, um, you know, uh, drawing courage from that uh, uh, weapon, he moves closer uh, to that thing, um, that thing which jumps upon his attention to discover a statue of Ganymede and Eagle. <clears throat> glistening in the moonlight, glistening once again is shining, something which is shining in the moonlight. Uh, you, you can go back to that earlier passage that I uh, discussed in detail where, um, you know, the wall seemed to glisten and there are dew drops perhaps, you know, it's damp and it glistens and now the shadow is glis um, the the statues are glistening in the moonlight. That incident for a time restored my nerve and a dim porcelain china man on a bowl table whose head rocked as I passed scarcely startled me. So he um, realizes that this is just a set of statues and um, he, uh, you know, uh, chases away his, um, you know, fear and he walks on and then he comes across a china man statue on a bowl table, the bowl table, very decorative in nature. A decorative table and this Chinaman is rocking its head. You can think back to the swaying head of the old woman and these um, swaying figures no longer scare him because he has um, just now realized that he has been scared by a uh, set of statues. So he passed um, uh, through this passage without being startled uh, anymore. I want to go back to this um, set of sculptures uh, of the Ganymede and the Eagle. The, this is a mythological reference. And um, the story goes uh, like this. Zeus was very attracted by the beauty of this handsome uh, young boy, Ganymede. So uh, what he does is he changes into an eagle and abducts this young man and uh, takes him away and makes him his cup bearer in his domain, in his um, uh, 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 kingdom, so uh, in Mount Olympus. So that is the story uh, behind this particular mythological reference. So what is the function of um, including 
these mythological details here, uh, it is a question that should uh, make you wonder about its role in this particular story. Perhaps there is a kind of uh, allusion to how power functions and the power of Zeus uh, here is in the fact that he can physically uh, take someone away um, by force and by you know using his magical or spiritual powers uh, he is able to do that. So, uh, power and its manifestation is a major um, uh, subject of gothic narrative. So, and that is perhaps being you know indicated here through this reference. Now, the narrator has come to the door of the red room um, and the steps up to it were in a shadowy corner again shadowy corner it is hidden once again. Um, I moved my candle from side to side in order to see clearly the nature of the recess in which I stood before opening the door. So, the narrator is trying to figure out how exactly um, everything is positioned where exactly he is standing and what are the uh, objects around him. Here it was thought I that my predecessor was found and the memory of that story gave me a sudden twinge of apprehension. So, the narrator is standing at the exact location where the dead body of the previous occupant of the red room was found. So, his predecessor was also a young man who wanted to test whether this particular place was haunted and um, quite unfortunately he dies um, in the process and his body is found in that exact place where he is running right now and that memory gives him a sudden um, uh, you know twinge experience of fear, twinge of apprehension, apprehension means fear. I glanced over my shoulder at the black Ganymede in the moonlight and opened the door of the red room rather hastily with my face half turned to the pallid silence of the corridor. So, what he does is he turns back to look at the statue of the Ganymede. Why does he do that? Why does he look at the uh, statue of that shadowy Ganymede here uh, is a question that um, can be uh, answered with a little bit of thought. Perhaps uh, he is um, thinking of himself as the Ganymede who is going to be abducted into this room. He is going to be you know uh, somehow kidnapped, kept prisoner in that room just as Zeus had um, you know abducted Ganymede. We do not know. So, that is one of the possible uh, ways uh, in which you can uh, think about this um, connection between the narrator and the uh, and the statue of Ganymede and what he does is he hope opens the uh, door of the red room rather hastily again a movement which suggests that he's lost his uh, equanimity he, he has lost his equilibrium he's acting hastily and his face half turned to the pallid silence of the corridor so he's still looking at the corridor as he opens the door once again the phrase pallid silence is very interesting because silence cannot be uh, pallid. Human beings can be pallid without any color. Pallid, if somebody is sick, they look pallid, they look drawn, um, there is a lack of um, you know proper blood flow, that is why they would look pale and pallid. So, silence of the corridor looking pallid is a very interesting uh, association. So, once again silence is being personified as a human being that in it that itself is being frightened by this whole set of affairs um, uh, around the red room. Now, the way to the red room uh, uh, the, is very interesting that is what I pointed out early on it is it's complex I would call it very intricate if you want to draw a map of the way to the red room when you read the story it is a very interesting exercise and you will realize that you know there is a uh, there is a long passage there is a staircase he climbs onto the staircase there is a landing again he goes into another corridor and there is a long passage and then again there is a set of steps. So, it is labyrinthine it is very convoluted it is like a maze and it is very long winded uh, and what is the significance of such um, size layout, what is the importance of this uh, um, you know setup. We are, we are kind of um, in the subterranean world literally the word subterranean is used in the story. So, literally we are in the belly, belly of the house perhaps um, you know um, and uh, symbolically we are in the 
innermost regions in the depths of the house and psychologically we are going into the inner recesses of the mind where uh, dark secrets are buried where um, you know horrors are hidden and things which we uh, usually like to submerge are to be found now the Lorraine castle is referred to for the first time in this uh, passage so that's the name of the castle in which we have the red room uh, and to which the narrator the brave narrator visits so I entered he says um, the narrator enters the red room of Lorraine castle closed the door behind me at once turned the key I found in the lock within and stood with the candle held aloft surveying the scene of my vigil the great red room of Lorraine castle so after a long time we have this reference to the name of this particular house in which the young duke had died or rather in which he had begun his dying for he had opened the door and fallen headlong down the steps I had just ascended so we have the name of the castle and we also have specific details about the young man who died a year ago trying to test the theory so the man who dies is a young duke one of the nobility one who is in the very higher ranks in society and um, he had begun his dying in this red room uh, because he just opens the door and he just falls down the steps and he is found dead the next day and that had been the end of his vigil that had been the end of his adventure of staying awake to witness the ghost of his gallant brave attempt to conquer the ghostly tradition of the place and never I thought had apoplexy better serve the ends of superstition so what the narrator here suggests is that the duke who had died has had a stroke apoplexy and people think that he had been killed scared to death by the ghosts of this particular room so that's what this young narrator believes so his death had served the ends of superstition has fed the needs of this superstitious narrative that's kept alive in terms of this uh, particular red room there were other and older stories that clung to the room back to the half incredible beginning of it all the tale of a timid wife and the tragic end that came to her husband's just to frightening her so on top of the story about the young duke who died of um, stroke there are other stories um, stories associated with a timid wife a frightened wife uh, who died because her husband tried to scare her just as part of a joke in the red room so that is also another tragedy which is associated with the red room so um, that again is also uh, interpreted as being a death caused by the ghosts of this particular red room so there are a set of narratives which could be interpreted in two different ways um, people who believe in the sub supernatural would um, you know claim that these are deaths caused by the ghosts of the red room whereas the skeptics like the uh, narrator would suggest that you know the wife was frightened therefore she died when the husband tried to scare her as a joke and then you know uh, the young duke died of a stroke not of um, ghost attack so these are some of the legends that surround this particular uh, red room in R Lorraine Castle and the young narrator you know uh, occupies the shoes of the young duke who had gone before by uh, you know occupying this red room and starting his vigil he holds aloft the candle and uh, surveys the room and looking round that huge shadowy room with its black window base, its recesses and alcoves, um, its dusty brown red hangings and dark gigantic furniture, one could well understand the legends that had sprouted in its black corners, its germinating darknesses. Again, uh, a very um, you know dense um, set of uh, details uh, to describe the red room. Uh, once again um, the narrator notices the shadowy ness of the room there are lots of shadows in the room and um, the windows are black um, uh, in color the window bays are not of a lighter color but black and its corners of course would be dark and its um, uh, hangings are dusty and it's brown and red 
perhaps you know the color giving the room its name uh, red room and the furniture are gigantic massive furniture and um because of its setting itself you know all these legends could have come about and he says that you know um, legends had sprouted had come about in the black corners uh, of this particular room you know the corners seem to breed all these darknesses germinating producing darknesses germinating darknesses my candle was a little tongue of light look at the way he describes the um, light from the candle it's a little tongue of light it's very weak it's very weak and and the uh, again the choice of the word tongue once again um, you know uh, associates it with some kind of human like quality it's like a little tongue of light in the vastnesses of the chamber it's raised fail to pierce the opposite end of the room so it's, it's weak um, in strength um, and 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 uh, in compa uh, in comparison to the vast darkness surrounding the candlelight, right? So it's like a uh, it's like a sole light, single light against the sea of darkness, and therefore it fails to pierce to the opposite end of the room. It's not able to throw its light to the very end of the room, and therefore, since it's not able to do its job of bringing light to the entire room, there was an ocean of dull red mystery in the red room. So there was a lot of darkness and that darkness is um, you know reddish in tone and there's mystery to it and plenty of suggestion sentinel shadows and watching darknesses beyond its island of light and the stillness of desolation brooded over it all the concluding um, you know ideas in this passage is extremely evocative you can almost imagine the vivid shadows um, you know which are human being like uh, in, in, in their appearance uh, look at the word suggestion sentinel shadows shadows behaving like gods like sentinels like watchmen and watching darkness as the darkness has become human like again and they are watching what's happening in this red room um, you know, and watching darkness beyond its island of light the island of light is produced by that candle the rest is darkness right and and in that darkness we have you know all these sentinel shadows and the stillness of desolation brooded over it all there's a kind of a desperation there's a there's a bleakness there's a sadness there's a there's a negativity that seemed to brood over it all that seemed to kind of sit over it and think over it all thank you for watching i'll continue the next session